evening. Hello. Hi, Father. I think we're broadcasting now, so we're good. We can start the uh, introduction and get on with uh, the presentation. Um, I am I'm very honored and glad that uh, Father Alexander uh, said yes. I, I called him and asked him, actually I didn't call him, I emailed him. Uh, asked him if he'd be willing to uh, come and give one of our Lenten lectures. And I had a topic in mind because uh, he and I had talked a while back, and uh, he came up with a title, which I don't know whether many of you kind of have any inkling of where it's going to go. But, you know, we're, we're actually prepared, I think well prepared, for uh, a topic such as the Theotokos in America right now, because in our parish, in the last, I don't know, four or five months, we've hosted the Mer streaming gave it on icon of the Theotokos from Hawaii. We've hosted Our Lady of Sitka from Alaska. And we are keenly aware in our Orthodox spiritual tradition of the place and the importance of the Theotokos in our prayer life, our spiritual life, and in the spiritual tradition of the church as an intercessor and one that we can pray to and one that will listen to us and intercede on our behalf. This is a very personal and a very fascinating story that I think Father Alexander is going to share with us tonight. And I don't know if he's going to have any different details than what he's already talked to me about. But um, either way, I hope you enjoy it. Father Alexander and I go way back. We're actually classmates at St. Vladimir Seminary. <coughs> He was slightly older than I, not too much, not too much. Anyway, and uh, he has been a, a very, very hardworking servant of the Lord in, the, in his vineyard in the OCA for many years. The bio is, is very short. It doesn't really go into much detail at all. But uh, anyway, a brother in Christ, thank you, Father, for coming. I don't know if we're going to dim the lights a little bit or not, but Father uh, Gregory, um, actually, uh, this presentation, I, I pray, will uh, hold together and, and um, make some sense. Uh, it's, it, it's gone through a number of uh, permutations because it, it really came about uh, when Father asked me to share some recollections about a trip I took last fall to Latvia. and. Um, uh, and uh, so it originally that's, it came out of that request that this kind of came about that then during the course of he asked me what's, what is it going to be about and he said something about the Theotokos because you'll see it's part of the story and uh, so but this is not going to be like a slideshow of somebody's vacation so don't worry that's not going to be that I hope it will be interesting for you so this being um, uh, Lent um, uh, you know, in, in our Lenten services, there's in some of the Old Testament readings, there's the theme of return, um, especially in the readings from the prophets, Isaiah and others. It's the theme of returning from the exile in, in Babylon to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. And that theme of return is weaved into our Lenten uh, uh, songs and hymns for all of us. It's a return for us to paradise. And so I, I begin with a quote here from Zechariah, Return to your stronghold of prisoners of hope. Today I declare that I will restore to you double. And that's part of the reading that you will hear on the eve of, of Palm Sunday. And I love that image of prisoners of hope. That applies to all of us. And the restoration uh, is, of course, uh, to rebuild the ancient ruins. They shall raise up from forward devastations, repair the ruined cities, devastations of many generations. You will see that part of the story involved uh, returning items to uh, Europe, to Latvia, Russia, uh, to a country that had been torn, by, torn apart by uh, much destruction for many years. So, um, uh, so Latvia, some of you may not know where Latvia is. How many of you know where Latvia is? Oh, well, well, about but, but uh, many people do not. It's right here, right here. That's Latvia. That's, this is Europe, and uh, this is getting a little closer. There's Latvia. You can see uh, here's Finland, Saint Petersburg. That's 
right? That's the, these are the three Baltic countries, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania are the Baltic countries. They're all very small, and even though they're all Baltic countries, each is very unique, has their own language, their own culture, and um, history too. Latvia, they were all independently, they were part of what was the Teutonic Empire, during the Middle Ages, there's a large influence of Catholicism and Lutherans there. But during, from the time of Peter the Great, beginning of the 18th century, they became part of the Russian Empire. So there, you have an interesting blend there of, of uh, uh, medieval uh, uh, elements and, of course, Russian as well. And the capital of Latvia is Riga, and near Riga is the city of Limbaji. And that's where we'll be going. So. In Limbaji, um, there is a church like this, and this is a church um, of the Transfiguration, which was the end of my uh, mission last August, where I was taking a miter and some other liturgical items that belong to uh, this particular miter. You know what a miter is? It's a bishop's uh, crown, and also a panagia. <coughs> panagia is the object that bishops wear, uh, icon of the Blessed Mother Theotokos. These two items belong to this man right here, who is Archbishop John Garkloss. He and I share the same last name. I'll tell you more about that. And this is a picture of when he came to America in 19, he came in 1949. This was taken about 1951. He was serving at the cathedral in New York City, Metropolitan Leonti. This is Easter. This was a little feature of Life magazine in 1951. And there you see that miter that you just saw earlier. And here he is with that Panagia that I showed you. This is a, when he was at Fort Ross in California. So Archbishop John, here he is. He was the, uh, 1898, 1992. He was from 1957 to 1978 the Archbishop of Chicago and Minneapolis. And during his time, he left an imprint on the, on the diocese and on the Orthodox Church in America. Um, so, what, so a little bit about him, because I you may not know anything, or maybe it's a complete surprise to you, or, or, or you maybe heard the name. So he is um, he's a Latvian. He is a Latvian born. So he was a, his you know, ethnic roots are Latvian. He's not a Russian, but his parents or maybe his grandparents converted to orthodoxy. I mentioned that Latvia became part of the Russian Empire, and the Russian church had an influence in converting some of the uh, l l native Latvians. And in the 1850s uh, or 40s, there was a very um, kind of a pretty uh, impressive missionary effort by the Russian church to evangelize Latvians. They translated books into Latvian, and many Latvians became orthodox including Archbishop John's parents. Uh, so he was a Latvian speaker. He had to learn German because German was an influential language and Russian as well as it was. And he was, always, he was a Latvian. He was a very, um, uh, very had a great uh, veteran, uh, love for Russia itself and the Orthodox Church. The Latvian Orthodox Church has uh, today, um, it says 100, about 140 parishes. Uh, clergy, and, and uh, this is the cathedral in Riga. It's, one of the, it's the largest Orthodox church in all of the Baltics. The cathedral of the Nativity was built in the 1890s. And uh, there are more, uh, the Latvian Orthodox church is bigger in size than the OCA. Uh, why? Because 40% uh, of Latvia are Russian-speaking people, of which uh, almost all of them are baptized, or a good number. So probably the number of people in the Latvian Orthodox Church is probably something like 300,000. So sort of just in terms of numbers, it's bigger than the OCA at the present time. So that's again the cathedral. And that's the inside of the cathedral. I just wanted to show you a couple of pictures of the beautiful churches uh, in, in Riga. And... Uh, uh, also, Latvia became a home for many old believers, old believers that felt uh, uncomfortable in Russia. They moved. There's a large old believer presence in Latvia. This is one of the old believer churches. 
this is a, a Latvian church, and you have good eyes, I want to point out that the inscription over the iconostas is in Latvia, in German Old Gothic script, but it's in Latvian. So um, it's very interesting to see that, you know, there was this rather, you know, impressive uh, movement to uh, evangelize uh, Latvians or the, using their, their own uh, uh, language and their own traditions even. So back to Limbaji. Uh, so Archbishop John was born there in 1898. He was the son of really farmers, very, very poor peasants. His father died when he was very young. His mother was very devout. She went to this church. This is a photo from the early 20th century. It's the Church of the Transfiguration. It was built, of course, by, by Russian builders. This was built for the, the local Latvian Orthodox community. That's the inside uh, of the church from around that time. And so Archbishop John was, um, his father, he worked as helping his mother, worked on the farm, but he was very devout, and even from a young age, he served in the Russian army <laughs> in World War I. Um, afterwards, he worked as a tailor and became the choir director of Tsolomshchi, that's the cantor at that church that you just saw. And there he is, right there. And this, is, this, this was the priest at that time. This is some clergy, and that's John. Uh, in Latvian, his name was Yanis. Yanis is John in Latvian, and that's how he looked. He saved his money, went to seminary, and in 1935 or so was ordained. And there he is as a priest in 1936. <laughs> He served in three small parishes, doing a, he was a circuit rider, uh, and uh, he also had, a, he, as I said, he was a tailor, he trained, and all his life he later sewed, he, he did a lot of sewing. Uh, he, um, and he, and there were, that's where the story, and he was a very, we know, just a devout, <coughs> humble priest, and he seemed to be, he loved that, and things would have continued that way. <clears throat> If it weren't for changes, that, he, that, that was 1936, in 1939, uh, World War II starts. And there's a lot of interesting history here that I, I, I don't want to go into depth, but simply to um, <clears throat> see, Latvia was part of the Russian Empire after the revolution. It was um, independent. The Baltic countries were independent from 1917 to 1939. 1939, those of you who know history, there was a non-aggression pact between the Soviet Union and Germany, and that's what allowed Germany to start the war, and the Soviet Union recaptured the Baltic countries and part of Finland, and there was a lot of fighting. And so with that, uh, the, the Russian church now, uh, where the Latvian church had been going through some canonical problems, but now the, the Russian church from Moscow sent a bishop to straighten out the canonical affairs in Latvia. And the bishop they sent was this man, Sergius. And he was the right hand of this man, who was Sergius Stragorovsky. And if you know Russian church history, he was the successor to Tikhon. The Russian government didn't allow the church to, to make him a, a, a patriarch. He was the locum tenens. <coughs> And it wasn't until right after, during the war, 1944, that he became patriarch of Moscow for a brief time. A lot of history, a lot of complicated stuff. So Sergius was his right-hand man, and he, Sergius, sent this Sergius to Latvia. This is all going to connect. So, you know, <laughs> and there he is, he's made metropolitan, and he's in Latvia. And what happens, he's, he, now, history again. So it's part of the Soviet Union, except in 1941, the Germans decided to attack the West Eastern Front. And so they very quickly go and they capture Latvia. Latvia falls in a matter of days or a week. And now all those Baltic countries and a good part of, of, uh, of Western Russia is behind German lines. The Germans surround Leningrad, if you know the story, Leningrad becomes a siege. The Germans press further east to a town called Tikvin, and that will get into my story in a second. And this bishop, who was a member of the Russian church during those very difficult 1920 and 30, is now finds himself behind German lines. 
And the Germans, um, very, they were not, um, you know, they were Christian. They were, of course, fighting a war. But the Germans very quickly realized that they could utilize uh, the Orthodox people under their, behind their lines for propaganda, and maybe even some legitimate way. They opened up churches that had been closed, and and they also kind of, you know, said, well, look, you know, you, you come with us and you recognize us Germans and, you know, we're going to liberate Russia from these godless communists. So there was a kind of a movement among some people, but the Sergius was became a leader of a um, of what was became the Pskov mission, which was a, 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 a kind of a, un, a canonically makeshift canonical cr uh, creation of Russian Orthodox parishes that were behind German lines. And these were people who had been deprived of regular church life, and so churches uh, were filled, and of course, it being war, you know, you could, people, that's uh, when people go to churches, you know. By the way, let's hope and pray that we in America don't have to go to war to get people to come to church, but it's, it's interesting. We were priests, I was a priest in Long Island after 9-11, and the Sunday after 9-11, the church was like Easter. It's a sad fact that we wait for tragedy to go to church, but such is life. The war, and uh, the town of Tiefen, as I mentioned, was overrun by the Germans, and this is the monastery, and within that monastery, they found the icon, the Tiefen icon, which I'll talk more about soon. But this, this picture may scandalize some people, because you see this, of course. So as I mentioned, the Germans realized that they could use this, they took the icon as war booty, as a, as a tro tri tro trophy of, you know, when the army conquers, they take works of art and things, and this icon and other religious articles at that secret monastery, they took with them as, as you know, now to their possession. <coughs> Miraculously, this icon had Maybe because Tiefen is off the grid, so to speak, it's not a big city. In most other places, famous Russian icons ended up um, in museums or in places like Hillwood. Yes. <laughs> like Hillwood. You know the story about Hillwood. The people like, well, Meriwether Post, her husband was a, um, the ambassador in the 30s. Icons, chalices, they buy them up. So, Things, it would have ended up somewhere like that. But it somehow was was kind of off the grid. And so the Germans bring it, and they, in the city of Pskov, they give it to the church. They say, well, you can you know, pray to it, use it. Look at us, we're pretty good, are we nice people? So the, this, uh, you know, general or somebody's giving it to this father, Kirill, and, uh, and so that icon, um, is being utilized by the church in the city of Skol. And um, of course, it's war, a lot of things happen. That Metropolitan Sergius, who I talked about, uh, realized he needed another bishop. It was war. He himself was headquartered in Vilnius, in, this, in Vilna, which is in Lithuania. But he wanted a bishop in Riga. And, well, where, where, where is a, we need a bishop, so you need a, a celibate. And somebody said, well, there's this Yanis. Gar clubs there are some place in the country in Latvia. Who is he? Well, he speaks Russian, he speaks Latvian. Serge says, well, bring him in. And so, you know, he says, well, uh, you want to be bishop? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> he, um, you know, probably did not, but humbly accepts. And so, uh, in February of 1943, this is the Sergius, uh, now, and he, this is John, consecrated John. Bishop of Riga, 1943. He becomes a kind of a, and that's shortly after consecration. And there again is that kind of gear, but, uh, And he becomes kind of a part of a, you know, the, 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 the consistory of the chancery. Here's Sergius, here's John, there's some other. Here's a priest named Nikolai Vagelis, who ended up in Berkeley, California, by the way. And here is. Um, Searches again. And by the way, that's the mitre that uh, I'll talk about later. And here's John and the Bishop Daniel of, of Kovna. And um, so they, um, you know, were serving and preaching and teaching. And here's Searches again. And the reason I put, put this picture here, the day after this picture was taken, 
uh, Sergius was uh, driving from <coughs> Lithuania to Riga, and along the road, he was shot. He, he, uh, there was an ambush by some people with guns. They, to this day, they're not quite sure if it was Germans or Soviet partisans. Anyhow, he dies. He had to really walk on a razor's edge because he was beginning to declare and publish uh, the actual um, first-hand descriptions of how horrible the church was being treated in Russia. Because the Russian Soviet government was kind of perpetuating this myth that, oh, we have freedom of religion, that, that you know, just people don't want to go to church. In fact, as you know, we know now, priests, uh, bishops, uh, faithful were being killed by the thousands. And the Russian church had to kind of swallow their tongues if those who were in Russia. But now the surges began to kind of, and some of these papers have been, of course, not published, and they revealed the situation of what was going on. So there was some probably political um, motivation to get rid of him, and he is assassinated. And he, this is his funeral. Uh, as, as in, uh, April of uh, 44, April of 44, <coughs> John, Bishop John. The reason I'm pointing uh, this picture, this man here <coughs> is my dad. Oh. He was uh, a Kilenik, a subdeacon, a friend. Uh, my father's parents were Russians who came to Latvia in 1939, and they met Father John Garklaus in this village church. My dad was just a little boy. Father, Bishop, uh, Father John said, would you like to serve? Sergei, you want to serve? So why not? He becomes an altar boy. And when my dad was 18 he, or 17, he goes to Riga, to the Russian high school, where he again meets John, and he becomes the Bishop John said, well, I need a young man to be subdeacon and Kilenik. And that's, there's my dad around that time. Uh, Later on, they end up in the DP camps, and when they have to, well, I'm jumping now to 1949, uh, it, getting into America after the war was not easy. It took them four years waiting in the DP camps. And to kind of uh, expedite the matter, my father, who was Kozhevnikov, took a, a, was a kind of adopted to become Garklops, which is how my Bishop John was not married, he didn't have any children, but my father became uh, Sergei Garklovs, and so that's how I'm Garklovs. But here's Bishop John. After the Sergius is killed, he becomes kind of the Bishop of Riga and the diocese. He's, this is a group of, of nuns there at a convent. And by the way, the, the icon, the Tikran icon now has moved to Riga because the Soviet, the Red Army is on the move. And so now they, they bring the icon to Riga. In, in 44, for a short period of time, and um, uh, and very soon after, uh, this priest who I mentioned already, Father Nicholas Vagelis, uh, the bishop in August of 44, the Red Army is about to attack Riga, and the bishop is informed by certain Germans, look, if you want to leave, you've got 24 hours, pack and go. Um, the r religious people realized that once the Soviets took over, they would end up in gulags because Stalin felt anybody who was behind German lines was a traitor. So even Russian soldiers who ended up as prisoners of war were then somehow punished by this crazy Stalin. So Bishop John takes his mother. He asks my father if he wants to come along. I said, that's why not? He's 18. Let's, let's go see the world, you know? You know, I can't imagine what it was like, but. They decide to go for it. <laughs> they leave Riga, and then the next day, this father, Nicholas, and from this convent, takes the Tikhon icon. The icon is taken with German convoy initially. So uh, it actually wasn't Bishop John who uh, initially took the icon to Riga. It came in a different way, but again, I'll try to tie this up together. And so they um, end up leaving uh, Latvia. They end up running, and you know, my father tells the story of bombs falling, uh, uh, Soviet bombs and American bombs. They they get they somehow get uh, miraculously to Poland. They take a train. They end up in Czechoslovakia. That's where this was taken. And for uh, over a year, uh, Bishop John and that father Vague was 
So they're behind, in Czechoslovakia, they're behind Soviet lines again, and then somehow by, by miracle, thanks to angels, they are able to get to the American zone after the war, uh, and obviously they were able to uh, somehow <coughs> escape the Soviets. So they live in these DP camps in Germany from 1944 to 49. Um, this is a kind of a group of people in that DP camp. This is also like a Lutheran bishop here. Uh, this is Father Lajinsky, who later became a priest in New York. Um, anyhow, and so the, at this point, uh, the icon falls. It, it, bishop John becomes caretaker. The icon almost, it seems, based on the facts that we know, the Germans took the icon out. But they're running for their lives. They're running for their lives, and they, um, you know, it's, perhaps it was just a couple of privates or something, and along the way, this icon kind of, uh, you know, is lost, and, and that Father Nicholas, I pointed out, uh, you know, tells Bishop, look, this chicken icon is there someplace. Uh, Bishop John says, well, we can't just leave that. Let's just take it. And so he being the bishop, the icon, he becomes the caretaker of the Tikkun icon, starting at that point, that's about 45. So, but, and now that's where the story of the Tikkun icon begins. But here's a couple of shots of when they lived in those German DP camps. And um, we can only imagine with what, um, you know, kind of uh, fervor and um, great spiritual longing people prayed for some answers to their questions about where they can end up. Many were hoping for America, some wouldn't wait, and they went to Australia or, or South America. But these DP camps were always filled of people, and uh, when churches were conducted, services, they were tremendously, um, you know, probably incredibly um, uplifting experiences. There's a, a procession with the Tikkun icon. <coughs> There's an, another one in winter, also. By the way, just a little note here, if you notice who's carrying the icon here. Women, oh, women. <laughs> so you know, some there's some there's women right here. Two point two. You know, usually you know there's, there's there's a theory about only men should touch these things. That's all. But you know, that's what. I've never heard that theory. I don't think that's a good theory. <laughs> no. Well, I'm proving your point. I'm proving your point. It's, it's side matter. Side matter. Not good. But anyhow. Um, Okay, another another shot from those. DPs. So, in 1949, uh, Bishop John arrives in New York. Uh, this is from 1950. The Metropolitan Theophilus uh, dies in 1950. Leonti is uh, made a uh, March Metropolitan, and these, this is the synod of that time. Uh, this is Bishop John Chukovskoy, San Francisco. John. This is Bishop Benjamin. Uh, some of these others uh, you probably wouldn't know, and they're all gone, of course, with the Lord. And this is a picture of uh, Bishop John and the auntie serving in the Cathedral of uh, San Francisco, Bishop Nikon. This is Father George Benningson here. And Father George Benningson was very involved in that school mission that I mentioned. There's kind of notable presence there. And in 1957, John, Bishop John becomes Bishop of Chicago and Minneapolis, and this is Holy Trinity Cathedral in Chicago. Just serving, I think, in Cleveland. Uh, Father Innocent Frisco. <laughs> Some of you will know him. <laughs> he was, he was uh, initially Ted Frisco. But, and Bishop John um, deserves credit for reviving kind of diocesan structure in the OCA because the entire OCA, or Metropolia as it was, was really one large diocese. Um, there was the, there were sort of boundaries on maps, but there were no real diocesan structures. So Bishop John, who came with some experience from from the, uh, Europe, when he was assigned Bishop of Chicago, he kind of um, you know created this uh, uh, idea of a diocese having diocesan assemblies, meetings, and so forth. And uh, the diocese of Chicago and Minneapolis became kind of, in some ways, it was the first. Uh, our diocese in the OCA that had a sort of identity. Most of these people are all gone now. These some of these priests are were famous in their time. This is Father Vladimir Brzezinski, though, who I know that Matushka 
Sasha Rose. He's, I think the, I think he's the only one who's still living from that group. That picture is from Parma. Yes, that's from Parma. Yeah. Anyhow, um, so in 1977, a metropolitan Theodosius is elected. Uh, he was the first American-born metropolitan of our church. There was a great moment when that happened. And this is the synod from that time. And uh, I think all of these bishops are also with the Lord now. Yeah, so this is John, Shakovskoy, Kiprian, Gregory, Dimitri, Valeria, Bishop Kirill, Jose. This is, this is Bishop Herman, Metropolitan Sylvester. So, so Bishop John, as I said, he, uh, he, my father took the name Bishop John. From <coughs> all my relatives, living biological relatives, uh, were in Russia <coughs> when we were children. Bishop John was Vladika, and he was like grandpa for us. So this is. I just wanted to show you that this is sort of me, my brother, my dad, and so you know he was a bishop, but he loved us like uh, you know we were his family. And so there's an element of my life that's very much connected to this man as a person and as a bishop. And I just wanted to put that up there. And this is, this is uh, when we, that's me there. This is a trip to Mount Athos in 1971 that we took. So there's the Tikhon icon. So now we're going to talk about that. Uh, and I'll give you a little quick. Uh, uh, this was maybe about four years before Bishop passed away. So, this is the true part. Today, O Sovereign Lady, your most honored icon has shown upon us in the heavens like the most radiant sun, enlightening the world with rays of mercy in our land, receiving it reverently as a divine gift from on high. Glorifies you, Mother of God, as Queen of all. Joyfully magnifying Christ our God, who was born of you. Pray to him, O Lady Theotokos, that he may preserve all Christian cities and countries unharmed from all machinations of the enemy, and that he may save those who with faith bow down before his divine image, and your most holy icon, O virgin who knew not what lie. <clears throat> and this line, preserve all Christian cities and harm from all machinations of the enemy, that's in the original Trocar. And I think that's so significant. When, we, when the icon was returned to Russia 20 years ago, um, we felt very much that it was a it was a, a statement of the, the love and special relation between American Orthodoxy and uh, the Mother Church of Russia, and that um, that, that icon's presence in America was um, also had a spiritual uh, impact, even though America is not Orthodox as such. It's still a Christian land, and so I personally feel that somehow there was all it was all destiny and. God's plan. So this is the icon, how it looks today. Uh, this Oklad or Riza uh, is, uh, is is actually um, was not. The, it, there was another several made over the centuries, uh, but the way the way that icon came to Bishop John and to, to America was in this manner. If you notice, this top part actually doesn't match this part. That's uh, somehow different. But that's how it looks, and that's how it looks today. Still, now that's the real icon. Underneath that metal is what you see here. And it, to my thinking, this is better. Yes. yes. <laughs> it's, um, so, uh, it's a beautiful, it's just, a, it's really, a, it's, a, it's a masterpiece, uh, artistic. It's a, as, Masterpiece. It's a beautiful work. Um, well, so the tradition, as you know, this is one of several icons. There are several, I, there could be a dozen icons which traditionally are held to be have painted by Saint Luke. That's the tradition. If you go to like Wikipedia, look up Tikhon icon or um, the Vladimir icon. If you look, I say traditionally uh, ascribed to Saint Luke. Saint Luke, the tradition in our church, it's not. Now he wrote the uh, gospel, Saint Luke. He doesn't mention there that he's an iconographer. We don't have that in scripture, but church tradition does 
say that he, in addition to being a physician, that he was an icon, he was an artist. So there's that tradition. And that means there's probably something to that. Did he really paint that icon? Well, maybe, maybe not. But um, that, so there, anyhow, that, and that, that, there's a story in it that that icon was painted in St. Luke, it ended up in Jerusalem, from there to Antioch, Antioch to Constantinople. Um, it is a part of the, it is a, of the Hodogitria tradition, maybe you've heard that word. Icons have certain shapes, and it's based on the positions of, the, of Jesus and Mary, and based on their positions, uh, they, you know, there's a, icons of affection, millennia, uh, or icons of Hodegitria. Hodegitria is a Greek word means showing the way. And the, the, the kind of the indication of that is that her right arm here you see is in the position of showing the way to Jesus. In other words, he is the way, the truth, and the life. She's a Hodegitria type. The teeth in particular icon has a distinguishing feature that Christ, infant Christ, and by the way, he's not a baby here. He's a, he a young young man, adolescent even, but his right foot is positioned this way that the sole of his right foot appears. So if, if you spot icons like that, you could, that's how you nor normally associate them with that type. So we don't know much ex uh, about what happened before the year of 1383, because that's, in 1383 is when the Russian Chronicles say that the icon appeared in northern Russia. And the, 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 it's also kind of uh, legendary. It appears initially angels are carried over a lake in a bright light. But around that time, it's, it kind of mysteriously settles near a little town of Tikhvin, a little tiny town of Tikhvin. And in, uh, that's about 1383, 1384. And 200, so the icon is there, and it's not till 1500s that a monastery is built there around the icon, and that monastery becomes <coughs> the Dormition of uh, the Tikhvin Dormition Monastery. Uh, and in the early part of the 17th century, all of Tikhvin is surrounded by uh, attack by the Swedish army. There's a war that goes on between Russia and Sweden. And at one point, the monastery is surrounded. People panic. A, a bishop or a priest has a vision that if they take the icon out of procession, the, 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 you know, the people will be saved. And something happens. They do take the icon, out, and the Swedes see it, and they they, they retreat. And based on that uh, event, the, the word spreads throughout Russia. And it's from that time that the the uh, the Tikhon icon acquires a kind of a fame and becomes. Uh, it's it's um, it's no, it becomes noted like icons are noted on a specific day of the calendar year. If you look on your church calendar, there's a Kazan icon. Like, so the 26th of June becomes the day of the Tikhvin icon, and with that, there's a service, there's a tropar, and 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 what happens is that uh, copies are made. So you know that well, we're ta we're talking about the original, but. Tikhvin, uh, there's numerous, numerous copies all over the world, and this is a, a copy which has these little tiny um, vignettes of scenes from the life of the Tikhvin icon here. You know, different things, including, I guess, that, that thing with the Swedish army here someplace, and all that. But um, there, in, if you go to Russia, and even around here, it, probably in every church in Russia, it's not in every other one, there'll be a copy of the Tikhvin icon, they're, they're very uh, plentiful. So this is the Tikhvin monastery as it looked at the beginning of the last century. And this is how it looks today. So the monastery closed in the 1920s, as, uh, it's a function as a parish, it was just people went to church, but then the war came, as I told you, and after World War II, the monastery became kind of desecrated, it became a, uh, kind of a reform school for local uh, you know, teenagers and things. And, and um, so just like many monasteries in Russia just became you know, desecrated and quite um, uh, almost unrecognizable. Um, 
So uh, this is part of the monastery. In, in the, so the icon was, this was the church where the icon was kept in the winter um, because it's a smaller church and it was heated. The main cathedral um, is, is, is not heated and so the icon is taken back and forth uh, at the beginning of, uh, uh, well, in, in the fall, it's taken from the cathedral to their other church and in the spring on the other way. Back. So there's a famous painting of this Tikkunaika being taken from the to the cathedral in the fall of the year, and this is the Tsar uh, Emperor Paul, I believe, uh, kind of a famous painting of that icon being moved from one place to another. There's the monastery again. <clears throat> so. Uh, the icon, so now I, the title of the talk is Father Gregory put the, the Tokus in America. So it, it comes to America in 1949. And uh, uh, Bishop John initially comes to New York and then uh, during, and then in, in Chicago in 57. And during those years, um, he took many a trip with the icon across the country. Um, and this is one such place, that I believe, in the church in California where the icon was taken. And, uh, you know, uh, it was, uh, th so this kind of veneration of icons was not um, very popular among Orthodox people at the time because they had no reference to it. Because people are, are, are Orthodox people who built churches in the 19th 20s and so forth. They, you know, they didn't have icons like this. They, you know, they had icons on the wall, iconostas and things. But you know, things like it's become more uh, kind of uh, well known today. And now you know, there's icons from Saint Icons and that are traveling and things. But in the 50s and 60s, it just somehow it just doesn't didn't resonate with people. So um, Archbishop John did take it around and uh, take, would take it to New York or Saint Icons Monastery. Um, but um, as a rule, you know, there was not a lot of uh, interest in it. And, you know, he, he, it's not like he would go, you know, he, he was very mindful of the fact that this is a, a spiritual um, treasure, a spiritual um, a holiness. It's a, it's a relic kind of, and it's not, it's, you know, you don't merchandise it or, or, you know, it's not for kind of, you know, you know, like, Proclaim, look, look what I got, or something. He was very mindful of preserving it and honoring it with humility and reverence. But um, he uh, did travel with it, and uh, it was uh, when he came to Chicago. It was at the cathedral. <coughs> this is a, a picture from about 1977. Uh, this was the, I the feast of the icon and um, and a coffist. Uh, this is Archbishop John here in this cathedral uh, in Chicago. And this is a picture of him with uh, when the cover was taken off. So Archbishop, you know, um, there was some controversy. Um, you know, people uh, had their opinions about where this icon should go, who should take the care of it. Uh, uh, maybe it should be in a church, maybe in the St. Tikhon's Monastery. Um, and you know, people would have uh, opinions on that. Well, why shouldn't they? But Archbishop felt that it should return to Tikva, and he had a strong sense that that's where it belongs. And so he guarded that, uh, and uh, and he got some flack because of that. And uh, but he, the icon was always accessible to people. But he felt that you know it should go to Tikva. That's where it belongs. Now he died in 1982. That's shortly before he died. That's how I remember. <laughs> he died in '82. That's uh, at Saint Tikhon's Monastery. There, my dad was looking out at the grave, and he entrusted my father with the care of the icon, with specific instructions that it should only be returned to the monastery Tikhon. Now, this was '82, before anything like that was possible. I believe Archbishop must have had some kind of premonition that things would change, and they did. Um, after, so my father became caretaker of the icon, and this is my mother, who was, I would say, a big helper to my dad. 
This was uh, icon there shortly before it went to uh, Russia. And uh, what happened was that in 91, of course, the Soviet Union collapses, and the church in Russia now is uh, uh, revives and is restored. Uh, it doesn't happen overnight, but by the end of the 90s, about 98 or so, the monastery in Tikhvin is returned to the church, and some official now um, official requests or indications are uh, come to my dad and to the church that maybe it's time to return the icon. Uh, I should note that you know there were offers from uh, Russia, offers to my father, my parents to, to buy the icon, you know, a million to whatever, you know, there because there there were people in Russia who were eager to get it back, not as a religious thing, but as a kind of historic artistic work. But my father was very firm about that and felt that it should go to Tikhvin. And so, um, in, starting in about 2002, uh, he and I went several times, and finally negotiations began in 2004, that's 20 years ago, the icon was returned to Tikhvin. Um, this is just, a, this is a, just a, it was a, a week before its return, there were services in Chicago, and that's the final service in the Chicago Cathedral. Dr. Paul Herman was there. The cathedral was full of people as well. It was kind of a sad moment. And the return involved it going first to Riga, because we felt that Riga, that's where Archbishop John met the icon. And so the return should kind of start in Riga. And it was a phenomenal thing to be there. We never expected it to be, to attract as many people as it did. You just see a crowd here. There was. I don't know, tens of thousands of people that was in Riga for about four days. You see a crowd there. People waited like 24 hours um, to see the icon, to venerate it. It's, and that, that was the indication to us of what a phenomenal moment it would be. <clears throat> you know, people were asking us before uh, going there from America, I remember somebody from New York Times asked me, I mean, what is the significance of it going? And the only thing I could think of comparing it to, like, that for Russia, it, it had the, it wasn't just a work of art, but it had a tremendous uh, historic spiritual significance. Like I said, for example, if in America, the Liberty Bell was <laughs> ended up someplace in, say, uh, in Ireland or something, <laughs> or France. And, like imagine if like, you know, the Liberty Bell was taken from America and then it was returned. I mean, that would be a big thing. Like, oh, you know, the Liberty Bell is back. Well, the Tikhan icon returning to Russia, it, it had, it was that scale of, of uh, something awesome and wonderful and otherworldly happening. And um, so after Tikhvin, uh, I'm sorry, after Riga, it went to Moscow, where it was there for several days. It, uh, from there was a procession through Red Square, um, taken to. Red, by the way, this is he was the Metropolitan Kirill. That's the current patriarch there. And we walked from the Cathedral of Christ the Savior to Red Square. That's my dad being here, and. Um, this is already on the train, and it was in Petersburg for a whole week, and again, you had crowds lining up for hours to venerate it. It finally ends up in Tikhvin. This is at the Tikhvin railroad station, um, where again, a mass of people, I don't know if it was a million, but it could have been 200,000 people were there, and the icon just was taken out of the train, train station. Uh, this is the procession through town, Tikhvin, and at the monastery, uh, people decorated the, the lawn the, from the, the gate to the main cathedral, which is, oh, at least like the length of two football fields. It was decorated with these flowers. I'll never forget that. It was really uh, incredibly beautiful and touching. And so that's finally the icon being brought back to the cathedral and placed in its place of honor where it was originally in the cathedral in Tikhvin. And 
Every year on the Feast of the Icon, uh, old, uh, new calendars, June 26th, old calendar, June, July 9th. And um, that's the current Bishop of Tifin, Mstislav, that's the, that's the original icon. And they made an exact copy. They made an exact copy. And that exact copy now is in Chicago. There it is. It's uncanny how they made this. Uh, it's exact to the point where on the original icon, you know, it had been through a lot. Europe and DP camps and them traveling. So there, it, there's some damage to the reason. <clears throat> there's some strings of pearl that are missing. <clears throat> Things, you know, there's a couple of dents in the visa. So when they copied this, they copied those dents. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, they copied it. And it's, it's amazing. But, you know, uh, <clears throat> when we were negotiating the return of the icon, um, personally, I felt like, well, um, well, you know, you, you want the you know what this you know what this gold thing or you want the real icon, right? No, they want the whole thing. I mean, I even like said, well, you take the take the cover and leave the icon. <laughs> but, but they um, and I thought for sure that when they got it to Tika, they would just um, display it without the cover. But it seems to me that that's the icon. That's how it is, and that's how people like it there. And that's how, if you go to see it, that's what, that's what you'll see. <clears throat> so back to, I'm going to wrap this all up. So that miter, <clears throat> that's the kind of, that miter, which belonged to that Metropolitan Sergius, and then when he died, Bishop John got it, and he wore it, John did. And in that Bishop John's town in Limburgy, um, they made a little museum in his honor. So they wanted to, some relics uh, of his, and I wanted to bring this miter. This, this was placed on the grave of that Metropolitan Sturgis that I talked about before taking it to Limbergy, I put it there. And so in Limbergy, which is the town where Bishop John grew up, and there's a church now, a lovely little church. This was the rectory, and in this rectory, they, there's one room that's a little museum in honor of the bishop. <clears throat> so last fall, I was there on Transfiguration, we were there for a feast. That's the bishop of uh, one of the three bishops of Latvia, John. <coughs> Service, <coughs> presentations, lovely iconostas. And there I am bringing this mitre to that museum. And just showing, I brought an old set of vestments and some books. Bishop John wrote music by hand at the DP camps, and I brought that for their mm. museum. And that's Michal, that Panagia, that there's a picture of the bishop of us, that same Panagia there. And lastly, we went to the cemetery to pray at the, where the bishop's father and brother and his um, nephews are buried. So that was kind of the end of that. So if you remember, I wanted to, at the beginning of my talk, I call it sharing of uh, recollections and emotions and there's a lot of uh, I, I don't know if I, I conveyed that to you but there's no need for me to convey it to you but there's a lot of emotions involved in these stories and uh, so we all have our own stories but I, I thank Father Gregory for inviting me to share what I hope is an interesting story that you can appreciate but sort of sharing emotions. So I want to end with a quote that I thought, I was looking for a perfect quote. I, I don't know if this is it, but one of my favorite poets is T.S. Eliot. So this is how I will end. Of all that was done in the past, you eat the fruit, either rotten or ripe, and the church must be forever building and always decaying and always being restored. For every ill deed in the past, we suffer the consequences for sloth, for avarice, gluttony, neglect of the word of God, for pride, for lechery, treachery, for every act of sin. And all that was done that was good, you have the inheritance. For good and ill deeds belong to a man alone when he stands alone on the other side of death. 
But here upon earth, you have the reward of the good and ill that was done by those who have gone before you. And all that is ill, you may repair if you walk together in humble repentance, expiating the sins of your fathers. And all that was good, you must fight to keep with hearts as devoted as those of your fathers who fought to gain it. The church must be forever building, for it is forever decaying within and attacked from without. For this is the law of life, and you must remember that while there is time of prosperity. There's some thoughts there about the story. So thank you for your attention. Thank you.